is off now. <gasps> Wait, we're live? Oh my God, what did I just say about children again? <laughs> I love them. Their children are amazing. They're not horrible. No. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to mute myself for a minute. Okay. All right, people are joining, so I'm going to begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, I should turn off my notification. Hello, thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Trip of the Dead by Angela Misery. My name is Chantel and I'm the marketing assistant at Cormorant Books and DCB and I will be hosting today's event. So we have partnered with Another Story Bookshop for the launch and we encourage you to order Trip of the Dead from them. A bit about the bookstore, Another Story is located in the west end of Toronto and has 30 years of history as a proudly independent bookstore. You can purchase Trip of the Dead from them and request a signed copy that Angela can personalize for you. Uh, today's launch will consist of a conversation between Angela and author Kevin Sylvester and will be followed by questions which you can submit in the chat box. Uh, if you leave a comment or if you ask a question in the chat, you will automatically be entered into the giveaway for a chance to win one of three pieces of original raccoon art. Um, now, before I introduce the stars of today's launch, I want to hand things briefly over to Barry Jowett, the publisher of DCB Young Readers, to talk a bit about Angela's book. Hi, thanks, Chantel. Uh, well, first, I want to personally thank Another Story Bookshop for partnering with us on this launch. Uh, Another Story is one of the strongest supporters of independent publishers and local authors in the country, and uh, we really appreciate all the support they've given to us and to our writers. Um, and as Chantel just said, if you're looking to buy any book, and particularly Trip of the Dead, and get a signed copy, uh, if you're in the Toronto area, please uh, pick it up from Another Story. Um, if you're in other parts of the country, uh, and curbside pickup on Roncesvalles in Toronto is probably a little inconvenient, please support your local independent bookseller, especially now. Independent booksellers are the lifeblood of the book world, and we really need them to stay, stay strong. Uh, today, of course, we're launching Trip of the Dead by Angela Misery. Uh, at DCB, we're thrilled to be publishing yet another book by Angela. Uh, DCB is the Young Readers imprint of Cormorant Books. Cormorant uh, uh, publishes books on the adult side, DCB on the kids side, and Angela is such a versatile writer that she's the only author who has books in print under both the Cormorant and DCB imprints, uh, which is a huge accomplishment. Uh, not many people can publish books for such uh, different readerships. Uh, anyone who read the first book in Angela's zombie series fell in love with Trip the Raccoon and has to be excited that he has his own story now, and we're excited for it. Uh, so on behalf of everyone at DCB, I want to congratulate Angela on the new book and also congratulate the readers who are finding a zombie apocalypse they can love at last. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll go back to Chantel. Um, before I hand things over to Kevin, I just want to introduce uh, the stars of today's show. So Angela Misery is the author of the Portia Adams Adventure series and several essays on Sherlock Holmes, her middle grade novel. The first in the Tales of the Apocalypse series, Pickles vs. the Zombies, is a Hackmatech Children's Choice Book Award finalist and was shortlisted for the 2021 Merca, the Manitoba Young Readers Choice Awards, on the Sundogs list. Uh, Kevin Sylvester has written and illustrated more than 30 books for kids. His latest novel is The Fabulous Zed Watson, with an exclamation point, which was co-written with his kid, Basil. He also has a new series, The Hockey Super Six. His other novels range from science fiction to mystery novels and other superheroes. His picture books include Garan Tua Jr., Defender of the Earth, Super Duper Monster, Great, and Splinters. He also writes and illustrates nonfiction books, such as sports books and books on financial literacy. Uh, and with that, I will hand things over to Kevin to take things away. Kevin. Thank you, Chantel. Uh, although I feel like, uh, thank you for having me, Barry. Thanks for having me, Angela. Thanks for having me. Uh, I like the flower, very nice. Thank you. I think Barry's already kind of given it away though. We're calling this a zombie apocalypse story you can love, which was mm. kind of like the best live book launch blurb I think I've ever heard. Um, all right, so let's launch into it here. Uh, I've read both books, as you know, love them both. They're so much fun. There's such a variety of things we can talk about. But for people who are joining us who might not know, Angela, give us a, a kind of an overview, a synopsis, or a prem what the premise is for these books. I, I would love to. Kev, thanks so much for doing this. And Chantal and everyone at DCB, thanks for having us. 
Um, so Pickles versus the Zombies was the first book in this series, and it was about uh, it was about what happens to the house pets when a zombie apocalypse happens. That's literally the question I was trying to answer. And as a journalist, I followed it all the way through to the end. Hmm. So this first book was about um, a cat who discovers that there's a zombie apocalypse happening, and her pet, his name is Connor, uh, goes missing. And so she goes on an adventure to go and find her pet in the midst of this zombie apocalypse. And she gathers all these fabulous mammals into a fellowship to try to find him. And that's what the first book is about. And so Trip is one of the uh, adventurers that she brings along. This is Pickles, that is Trip. And he's one of the many mammals that she gathers up and uh, tries to find Connor. That's what the premise of the book is about. I know, and we've both been ordered by Chantel not, it's in the notes, do not give away too much of the plot of these books. So we're yeah. doing our best. Um, one of the things that, I mean, one of the things that I love about them is that you can take out Apocalypse and have fun with it. But the other thing you did with the second book is you've changed the point of view. Why did you decide that Pickles was the focus of the first book and you were going to make this one from Tripp's uh, view of the world? I didn't actually know this was going to be a series. I, I, I have already done series before, as you know, and as you have done um, uh, in the past, I had planned for this just to be a one-off. It was going to be Pickles goes and finds her pet. And that was the end. And that was the entire story. And it was only when I got to the end and it got out there in the real world and I had beta readers and I had editors and fabulous people reading this and friends like you and uh, Joyce and many others who are if on the chat here, um, that people started asking me, so what does Trip do? So what does Wally do? Like what what is their adventure? Um, that I realized that this could be a series that I could write more stories from different points of view, especially because just like humans, um, all these animals are different and they, they take to this zombie apocalypse very differently. Like Pickles has a mission to find her pet. On, on Trip's side, that's not his problem. He's never had a pet. He's a Toronto vet raccoon. He's always lived in the neighborhood. He's always been like one person who lives in the neighborhood. So I live on Terrell in, uh, in the West End of Toronto and he's basically just living on my street. So the question was, what, what would a raccoon need? What would a raccoon take on? What would be the baggage that a raccoon would have going into a zombie apocalypse? And that became his story. One of the things I love about Trip too is that uh, like a real raccoon, uh, and we know them, like you said, they live in our neighborhood. One of the things that I love is that he's always kind of tentative <laughs> when he shows up and then kind of finds, right. I don't know if it's bravery, but he finds a kind of an energy and a boldness within him that you wouldn't expect. And it's like every raccoon we've encountered in our backyard, right? Like, absolutely. So how much did you like, how much did you, cause okay, first of all, let me, let me rephrase this. So pickles, you're a cat lover, you're a cat owner there, they own yep. you, I, whatever you want to look at it. There are cats involved here. Yes. <laughs> yes. There are cats in your house. So pickles is, is, was pickles based on a real cat, right? Like, yes. Sort of, yes. My cat named Copernicus. Yes. Yes. So you had that as your, you could sort of daily look at Copernicus and go, what would a cat do in this situation? Did you sit in yes. your backyard with scraps of food waiting for raccoons to show up? I didn't need to. I live in Toronto. Uh, I was born, I was raised in Calgary. So we never really experienced raccoons when I was growing up. It wasn't until I got to Toronto that I discovered they were so much just a part of your neighborhood, just a part of your house. Like you would get up in the morning and oh yeah, there's the raccoon and its newest pups. And like, that's, that's what's happening today. And they're hanging out and they're eating your dinner from last night. And they were just so casually like comfortable, like in my backyard, they were just like, Hey, what are you eating tonight? I'm eating this. It's like, it's very like communal. Um, so yeah, Trip is based on a lot of the raccoons that I've met over my time in Toronto. And um, I do feel like the raccoons are part of our family. I am concerned about them when I don't see them. Nice. So yeah. <laughs> as far as taking the, the, the original idea you had, like what would happen to the house pets? Where did that idea come from? Did, was it just like a rumination one day or were you watching The Walking Dead and going, boy, they never really talk about the dogs? <laughs> Well, I've read a lot of zombie books over my life and watched a lot of zombie movies, and I'm a huge Stephen King fan. But the truth is that my kid, who was 13 at the time that I started uh, thinking about Pickles, really wanted to watch The Walking Dead, like really kept asking me, can we watch The Walking Dead? And I was a fan of The Walking Dead, and I was like, no, I don't feel comfortable with you watching The Walking Dead. I don't even feel comfortable with me watching The Walking Dead some days. Yeah. And then she was like, well, can I read the comic books, the graphic novels? And I bought one and I was like, nope, I don't think this is suitable either. So finally, I started to think about why aren't there any zombie books for kids? Like it is a fun genre. I mean, it's scary, but so are a lot of genres. So why aren't we introducing these kinds of books to kids? And I thought, what could I write for a zombie book that would be 
something that I'd be okay with my 13 year old reading. And that's where Pickles came out that I started to think about, you know, there's something in The Walking Dead that we don't talk about is what happens to everybody's house pets? Like what, what do they do when they see all the humans changing over you? Like nobody answers that question. So I answered the question. That's interesting because I wanted to ask you about how you balanced what is a, a fairly, you know, you don't shy away from the violence in the books, like the violence that's necessary to survive when you have marauding zombies around. But yeah, yeah. when it's seen from the perspective of the animals, it it does seem more, hmm, more less, less, I don't know, less gratuitous in a way that The Walking Dead clearly revels in the violent acts themselves. How careful did you have to be when you were writing that then, if you knew that you wanted this to be for a specific age group? Well, there were definitely moments that I wrote more, like there were more scenes written in more detail with more gore that I had to walk back. Yeah. And I, I have a great writing group that I would like pitch this stuff at and be like, okay, when am I getting to the gross stage? And when am I going past gross into this is actually going to scare people? Um, and, and that line is actually, you're right, really hard to maintain. But in a world where we have, you know, Mockingjay, where basically 20 children get killed every, <laughs> every, uh, every year for this competition of theirs that, you know, it's just, it's just a natural part of their lives and everybody reads about it and they don't center on the death, right? Like you just know that there are now 18 people left. There are now 15 people left. And that's kind of the way I tried to approach it, where you don't go into detail about what is happening and, and what kind of blood is like lying there in intestines and all that. Mm -hmm. You focus on the fear. You focus on the fear and the reality of needing to save yourself. The other thing about animals, unlike The Walking Dead, is The Walking Dead is so much about the zombies, but also about how humans change into these evil characters, like yeah. just to survive the apocalypse. That is not something I think animals would do. I think they've they've worked within the survival instinct for generations without turning into like homicidal crazy people. Yeah. So they have a different approach. They're just like, let's survive this and then let's survive that and then let's survive that. It's not about let's survive and then dominate the rest of the world like that's never something I need to worry about so I very much just focused on what would they do like if this was an entire change their food chain has entirely changed it is no longer it is no longer what they grew up with it's no longer what any generation has grown up with what would they do yeah it's interesting you say that because it's almost like the and I think this is maybe particularly true of Trip who talks about this a little bit in the book or quite frequently in the book that there's one type of human and they have anti-raccoon sentiments. And then there's these other zombie humans that just had, they're just kind of like different slices of the same humanity that they, that Trip and the other animals have to deal with. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. You shrewd Because the humans are still humans and we're very, there's a lot of complexity to humans. Yeah, now this is a book launch. So uh, uh, we've talked a little bit about the series. We've set it up. Now I think you should read something. You and I were chatting yesterday. There's a couple different things. What do you feel like you would, would be a great intro to, to this book? The beginning? I think I'm, I'm going to start a little bit in. So this is right. chapter seven. Okay. So um, at the end of the Pickles book, Pickles has located Connor. And uh, it's great all the, all, the, all the fellowship that traveled with her on, her on her journey and her adventures to find Connor. They are accepted into this group of humans. And now they live there. They live in a place uh, that they call uh, the menagerie, which is a place that they, their humans have built for them so that they can live kind of with the humans. So the raccoon, the, the owl, <laughs> everybody who was involved in the first book is now living with the humans. So at this point, Trip is functioning just as a member of this group. And despite fighting really hard over this apocalypse to find others like him, to find raccoons. He has never come across another raccoon during this whole apocalypse. He's found lots of cats, deer, owls, birds, all kinds of things, but never found another raccoon. So this is sitting in his mind and he's, it's constantly like bothering him. So at the beginning of this book, what happens is a new human from a completely different group of humans comes in wearing a raccoon hat like a, a raccoon hat you would have seen, like with a tail and everything. And that is the first experience he has with a raccoon inside this apocalypse, which is just not, so not the way he wanted it. So this is the beginning of chapter seven and I'm gonna start. I can't wait to see the back of this stranger. Sitting up on the guard tower level with Ginger at my side, I glare down at the man. He's still wearing that raccoonicidal hat. I wonder if he's noticed me, noticed how a raccoon tail should look attached to a live raccoon. 
The humans of our camp stand around in a tense circle. Sarah and Uma are traveling to his camp with him, something about trade opportunities, which I know very little about, though most of my trading was with other raccoons, chipmunks, and squirrels. Chipmunks are, are ruthless traders. Sarah is one of my favorite humans. She always leaves the lid to the small garbage open for me, and she can't stop giggling when I wash my paws under the water barrel. Uma saved me from a pack of zombies once. I wasn't paying attention as I picked berries next to a stream and froze in place when they came out of the bushes. That's kind of my thing. When it comes to zombies, I freeze and I hope for the best. It's not a great strategy, I know. Only Uma's quick response saved me from being a tasty dead human treat that day. She's a tough old bird with an eagle's shaped beak shaped nose and eyes that are just as sharp. I don't want either of them to go with this stranger. Wally and his squadron walk by at ground level, the kittens falling out of formation every few steps. The old gray cat stops suddenly, causing the kittens to bump into each other like somebody spilled a basket of multicolored yarn balls, if yarn hissed. Uh, usually, Wally would turn into his drill sergeant vest, barking orders at this chaotic infraction. But something the humans are saying has his gray ears moving like mini satellites on the top of his head. Sonar races around the hissing squad, trying to reorganize them before Wally notices. What's up? I asked Ginger, who is watching Wally's tail and whiskers like I watch a human eating a drumstick, just waiting on the tips of my toes for them to be done with it so I can get my paws on it before one of the other scavengers. Before Ginger can answer, Wally glances our way and bowls over his newly organized squad of kittens. I leap down into the dirt, tripping over my own feet, but manage to meet him halfway. What? I demand. Other raccoons, he says as he skids to a stop. Duke says there's an entire family of raccoon at his camp. No freaking way, I reply immediately, pointing at the man's hat in disgust. No self-respecting raccoon could live alongside a mammal who wears them as a hat. Wally shakes his head. Sounds more like they're POWs than members of the community. POWs? Prisoners of war, Wally explains with a grimace. My stomach twists painfully, reminding me of the days before I found pickles and ginger in that apartment, when dodging zombies and eagles felt like I was on the losing side of a war I didn't start. I don't think I've had a secure night's sleep since the dead humans appeared. I, I have to help them, I whisper, shocking my furry friend. I'm a little shocked myself. I'm no adventurer. That's Pickle's jobs, or Ginger's job, or really anybody but me's job. But once the words are out of my mouth, I find I can't take them back, and the belt that's been squeezing my heart since Duke arrived starts to loosen. I have to go help them, I say, hoping I sound more confident than I feel and feeling that belt loosen a notch more. I need to find my own kind. It'll help me figure out my place in this new crazy world. Maybe I'll feel like there's a place for me in this other camp, or maybe I'll find a new gaze of raccoons to be a part of. It would be wonderful to be part of something again. So this is how the adventure starts. It's what in writing we call an inciting incident. <laughs> Don't give away the tips. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. That's lovely. Thank you very much. I uh, The hat is such a, a trigger for so many emotions in this book. Um, and also you, you, the hat, again, try, I'm going to keep trying to walk around any, any plot points, but the hat <laughs> represents in some ways the worst impulses of huma humans towards animals. Is that important for you to, to, for kids to understand that and, and to talk about that? Well, you, I started thinking. Is it important for you personally? Even? Like, I mean, it's something we don't think about enough. I don't, I don't think, we, I, I'm not saying that like I eat meat. Let's be clear. I love bacon. I eat meat and I probably wear, I'm, I'm guessing I wear animal, animal skin at some point. I have a leather jacket. Yes, I definitely do. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how little we think about these things from the perspective of the animals, because if, if an animal saw a raccoon tail, so if a raccoon saw a raccoon tail, how would you possibly explain that as, as fashion, as something we do for, for fashion? Like it just, I don't even know how you would explain it, but it's interesting when they have a conversation, Wally and Trip have a conversation about it. And Wally's like, you know, they wear cow skin, you know, they wear this, they wear that, and they wear this. And why didn't that bother you? Why does it only bother you when it's your kind? And it's a very interesting conversation to have that also reflects on, on things we are talking about as humans. You know, why do some things bother us? Why does it bother us when someone is prejudicial against us, me as a brown woman, but not when they're prejudicial against a Jewish person, which I am not. Like that conversation is, is I think really fascinating and one we need to keep having. So yeah, I think it is an important conversation. Have you found when you talk to kids that they clue into that? Obviously this book's new, but with like, even with pickles that they, they saw some of that? Cause you're really, you're assembling, using the, the animals as an example of a, of a diverse 
family, diverse culture, diverse community. I try to. I mean, it's funny how many kids like latch onto that as trip being different. And they totally understand what it's like to be completely different, like to have a pile of friends who all seem to be the same and have this, like, they're all good at school. They're all good at sports. They're all good. At, I'm the weird one. And that kind of, they really latch on to that. I think it's why they wanted a book about Trip so much. They wanted to know more about Trip. He's not just a follower. He's a member of this family and he's different. And uh, and he recognizes that. But when the first big, when the book begins, he recognizes it as a, as a negative. He thinks it's bad that he's different. Yeah. He needs to come to the conclusion as most of our children do, that different is good, different is wonderful. Um, and that's that's a journey that I I'm really excited that people get to take with me. The the uh, the over the overarching reality to a book like this, of course, is that it's a book about a kind of pandemic in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, Wasn't my plan. Wasn't my I, plan. <laughs> I know, but I mean, well, you wrote pickles before, so it's all your fault. Right. So yeah, it's obviously. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, um, sorry about that. <laughs> fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how much of the writing of this happened, like even the editing stage of this happened during this pandemic? Oh, gosh, uh, Trip Trip was entirely edited, I think, during the pandemic. Barry would have to like clear, clear it up for me, but I'm pretty sure because Pickles came out last year. Yeah, we would have been editing this whole thing during pandemic. And I'm writing the third book in the series, Val Hamster. So that one is also being done during pandemic. So is it informing yeah. you like is living during a real pandemic informing any of the things? things you're changing, think, things you're, you're observing that might change the way you're writing anything? Definitely this is sort of an not. open question, not just because it's about a pandemic. This is a question right. for every writer I know right now, so. It's true, and it's hard not to write about the pandemic specifically while still capturing elements of it. I think the thing that's coming out in Val Hamster very strongly, and Barry probably doesn't know this because he hasn't read a version of this in a while, <laughs> is the loneliness. Is, is the isolation is definitely coming across in Val Hamster. And in, in Emmy's case, Emmy has been a character in, in both the books so far, she's very used to being alone. She lost her first two best friends in the first book in Pickles. She lost two best friends who were dogs. And that has traumatized her to the point that she is forcing herself not to allow herself to become a part of a family, which is very isolating. And so looking at that through the, the, the um, lens of a pandemic, it's really interesting to take my own feelings about feeling isolated and talk to other fans who are also feeling isolated and how that reflects as you maneuver your way through whatever adventure you're doing. It's like something that just sits like, like a coat over you. It's like a constant reminder of loneliness. So yeah, it's definitely coming across. Wow. How many of the characters are based on people from your real life? Are they? All. Oh, they are. All. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's unpack all. that. This, this therapy <laughs> session we're having now. <laughs> well, Pickles is probably most like me, uh, probably like me when I was a teenager. Um, parts of Emmy are me as well. Uh, you know, the parts that were like 15 years old and highly rebellious. Mm -hmm. Wally is basically my father. Um, <laughs> I want a Ginger Wally is my book. sister. I want a Wally I know. Book. I was so surprised that people want a Wally book. You have to tell me why. Like, why well, do people want the Wally book? I, I have a theory. So Wally is crusty and grumpy, right? True and I have, I have a theory as a crusty, grumpy old man that kids <laughs> get a kick out of that. I think kids love grumpy old people. Why? I don't know. Stupid That's evidenced kids. by my dad's popularity. He, for his entire life, has been an old man. See? And he's popular. <laughs> kids love it. And I think they, I think they honestly, I think they kind of love the, the gruff, not if it's, not if it's menacing, but if it's actually no. just kind of that gruff, that gruffness that that is kind of funny and curmudgeonly or whatever I think kids respond to that I think they get a kick out of it so that's yeah, the next I, book I want after see, I get a lot of requests for Wally it's true yeah definitely <laughs> uh, I, I just want to point out I'm going to ask you a few more questions but if anybody else has anything you want to ask fire it in the chat and I will move over and read any chat questions so and the chat's a little long because people are yakking back and forth as they do which is fantastic but if you had a question that I might have missed throw it down there and I will I will ask those. Are you a fan of the Canterbury Tales? This feels so Canterbury Tales to me, these books. That's interesting. You think it's Canterbury Tales. I usually get Fellowship of the Ring or The Hobbit. Oh, okay. I see that too. A, 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 yeah, a group of, of completely unexpected characters that mix together. Yeah, and, but it's really any adventure story. It's so many adventure stories. So like Stephen King has a few adventure stories like this that I think it's like all the gunslinger stories have a little bit of this in it. So 
any, you know, any fellowship adventure story where different elements of people's personalities benefits the team at different times of the adventure. I feel like that story has been told a lot. And this is just one of them. It's funny when I was first writing it and Barry would send me a few like edits. And I, I said to him at some point, um, this is my fellowship story. This is my Tolkien. Please don't hurt it. Please don't damage it. And he was like, I respect that. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> but it, it feels like my Tolkien. It's my fellowship. It's my adventure. Now, uh, Val Hamster's next. Yep. You're immersed probably in the middle of that now, just knowing how things go. Yep. Um, do you have an end in sight for where you would like to see the overarching narrative go without necessarily, you know, giving specifics? But do you have in you, like, if everything hits, like you said, you didn't even expect this to be a, a yeah. more than one book necessarily. Did you, do you have a, a whole arc? I don't have an arc, but I have, um, you know, when you write your characters and you have an idea about what they are at the beginning and what they are at the end, mm -hmm. I do know where each of them needs to land by the end of the story. And unlike The Walking Dead, I'd really like to solve the zombie apocalypse. I just need it to be solved by the animals. Ooh, I was going to yeah. ask you about that, but I was afraid that 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 because that is one of the unsatisfying things. I find it too, right? Yeah. In most zombie stories, you don't get to the end. You don't get to well, how does this resolve itself? Do we just eat each other to death? Like, what is the plan here? Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think of a way that I can resolve it, that the animals help solve this problem for the humans and are, are forever change their relationship with humans. But, you know, that's a big ask. So I'm still thinking about it. I have a theory, which is that oh, yeah? the humans develop an antidote, but then mm -hmm. the animals are the only ones who can deliver it efficiently. Because as the last oh. three months have shown, humans suck at that. <laughs> We really do suck at it. Like consistently all over the world suck at it. Why are we so bad at this? I don't know. What is wrong with us? My God, I mean, we need more raccoons. More raccoon in our life. That's what we need. Oh, That's yeah. what we need. All right, I'm going to go see what's uh, what's popped up over in the chat here. Ooh, nice. Uh, all right, so what was your favorite part of writing this story? This is from Rebecca Upjohn. What was your favorite part of writing this story and uh, what was the most challenging? So favorite part of writing these? of trip uh favorite part of writing trip was thinking out his reactions to everything because he's such a physical character unlike pickles who's just a cat and she's very graceful and you know she like moves through life with a fluidity like you said i have cats too right in front of me who can demonstrate that with trip i was constantly thinking about what he would be falling into what he'd be tripping over what he'd be trying to get at with his fingers you know because he's such a physical character so that was the fun that was really fun to think that out um, how would he travel? Like, how would he travel at speed with cats? And um, how would he carry things? Because he can, like, he can open doors, he can do things that the cats can't do. So that physicality was super interesting for me to think about. Um, that was probably the most fun for writing for Trip. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the other question? What most, was most challenging? challenging? It was a double most loaded. Rebecca snuck two questions in with one. <laughs> most challenging. Cheeky. Yes, most challenging was figuring out how to get across that idea of that family is not necessarily who you are born to. Hmm. Um, because I, I, it's a complex idea. Uh, it's one that I believe in very strongly. Like I said, I moved from Calgary and my urban family is my family. My, my actual related family is mostly in India. So I, I needed to get that point across. Um, in a way that children would understand and and not feel intimidated by, but also feel like open to. So that was my my biggest challenge. I was constantly thinking about, okay, how do I make sure that they understand, yes, their mom and dad and their nuclear family or whatever family they have is super important, but this urban family is also really important as you grow up and, and as you develop and as you adapt and evolve. Uh, so that was the most challenging thing for me. It probably doesn't come across to anybody else in the story, but it was constantly on my mind. Although it's part of Trip's, uh, what would you say? Part of Trip's having to come to terms with who Trip is, is 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 recognizing that maybe they do have a place as weird as they are and as different as they are. So no, I see that coming through for sure. Okay, um, cool. Here's one from uh, Debbie Ridpath OE. Uh, important question for Angela, used all caps uh. as well. What would be <laughs> the first thing you would do during a zombie apocalypse? You know, I'd find a weapon. That's the truth. I actually have a good zombie plan. I've, I've done this and I've thought it all out for Toronto, like where I could get weapons and where I would have to hide. And um, would the Toronto Island be a good place to be? Depends if zombies can swim. So I've like thought out this whole plan. 
I've decided that my husband is probably not going to make it. So I'm going to, I'm starting to think about who would actually help me in this. Uh, my husband is darling and brilliant and a mathematician. And I think he would be thinking, and I just need people who can do. His point is that you need to think people who can think as well, but I really don't think he's going to make it. So I have plans. I have plans. Yeah. What do um, they say? You only have to be the second slowest runner. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Exactly. Okay. That's good. Never that's get good. so out of shape that you can't be the second slowest runner. That's right. Yeah. Or, or push somebody else, tie his shoelaces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is from uh, Melanie Fishbane, which is how do you approach world building in these books? Are you visual? Do you do maps? Uh, that's an excellent question. That is a really good question. And Melanie is a very good person to ask this question. Um, I, I am not very visual. Uh, when my husband and I were redoing my house, he had to keep showing me like he would tape things in the house and show me the sizes of things because I can't seem to I don't have that brain that imagines it. But the truth is that when I start writing a story, I do start to map things out because otherwise I will get them wrong. I learned that in the Porsche Adams adventures when I was writing them, mm -hmm. that I would say she came out of the bedroom and walked left. And the next time I'd say she came out of the bedroom and walked right. And it would be like, where the hell is the, where are the doors in this place? So I actually built myself like a, what are those called? The little models that kids make uh, that are like out of cardboard, diorama. 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 I, I made a diorama. And I literally would have that in front of me when I would write scenes in her house so that I would never get it wrong. Like the bathroom is to the right and the door to, the, to, uh, to leave the house is on the left so that I would always know. So I've gotten into a good habit of it because I'm not naturally a good visual writer. Nice. Although, wait, but actually, I forgot to ask you. So since we're talking about visuals, show people the drawing you did and tell us what it is and what oh, you're doing. Right. So I did these original drawings, which um, I, I have Debbie here and I have Kev here. So I feel a little embarrassed showing you. But this is what Angela is capable of drawing in terms of like little raccoon things. So it's just like a fun little drawing. And I made three of them because I wanted to film it. And it took me three times to get it the way I wanted it. <laughs> um, and we're giving these away. This is, there's a contest today to give you an original Angela mystery, which is even more rare than an, an original Kev because Kev is actually an illustrator. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot of garbage that I just throw out in the recycling. You can just like like trip, just come raid my my blue <laughs> bin at some point if you want I an original. Should. Um, okay, so and, and we'll give those away at the end. So we're gonna go through uh, and figure that out in a bit once we we're gonna pick names from people who have asked questions. Right. So that was an excellent question. Thank you. Joyce Grant, are you getting a hamster? I have two cats. I think that would be highly dangerous. Okay. Unless the hamster was like Emmy and then the cats would be in danger. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, yeah. Yeah, Emmy, Emmy can hold her own. Unless I can find that specific hamster, I don't think I can get one. I like Emmy. She's got energy, man. She's good. She really does. She's all that. Uh, from Peggy Purdue, any chance of a Portia Adams crossover where Portia solves the zombie <laughs> apocalypse? <laughs> That is very interesting. Um, I have been thinking about involving a cat in Portia's next adventure that could be Pickles or a raccoon that could be Pickles because in the fifth Portia book, she comes back to Toronto. So wouldn't it be interesting if she ran into Trip before the zombie apocalypse even happened? She's in the 1930s. So I have to think about it. I have to think about it, but that would be cool. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Although, sorry, I was reading a story the other day. I don't know. Anyway, you can figure out like some sort of imported Canadian raccoon, maybe like a Winnie the Pooh character who shows up at the London <laughs> Zoo or something. Um, exactly. Uh, okay, from Eric Walters uh, to both you and me. Who is my? Who is your? Who is our favorite character in The Walking Dead? Oh, you first, Daryl. Yeah, it's all one hundred percent. It's Daryl. Come, Come on. on, guy has a crossbow. Everyone <laughs> underestimates on a motorcycle. Him. Yeah, everybody underestimates <laughs> him. He seems like a, you know. Uh, uh, hick from you know rural georgia at the beginning and he's got the biggest heart of anybody in the show certainly not he's rick the best. A jerk um oh my gosh yeah man just kill him <laughs> off in season one uh uh debbie loves the fact that you didn't hesitate about answering the zombie apocalypse you knew immediately so a second question you answered it too fast mm. what advice would you have for young readers who want to be a published author like you someday oh so Mine my advice to young don't. readers Mine is always, <laughs> no, we don't need the competition. Stay away, you what about What about the middle grade millions? What about the middle grade millions? Middle grade like millions. there's so much money, yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so my good. advice for young readers uh, is the same as it is for old readers and for everyone is to read way more than you write, like read voraciously. And secondly, finish. Like uh, I know so many writers who just have these wonderful ideas and pitch these wonderful ideas at me. And I'm like, I want to read that. And four years later, they haven't even started putting pen to paper. It drives me crackers. 
because I need to read voraciously, which means you need to provide me with books, people. One hundred. So, please finish, finish your books. It's sort of funny with all this Dr. Seuss stuff too. Like, uh, I'm not going to delve that deeply into it, but the whole idea that there isn't a thousand books that have been published in the last five years that are instantly more appropriate and better for people to read. It's not like anyone's burning Dr. Seuss, although a Horton <laughs> Hears a Who has a lovely aroma when you throw it on the campfire. But anyway, I actually like Horton Hears a Who, it's fine. Um, alrighty, so I think your drawings are great. Tell us how to enter. So the way we're entering is Chantel is monitoring the names of people that are asking questions. She is going to pick some winners at the end. So stick around or, or she'll ask you to email her and that's how we're going to do that. So that is how that works. Um, Eric Walter says he has a crossbow. Oh my Lord. I'm not surprised. It's probably up <laughs> at the cottage. It's probably up at the cottage. He uses it to go fishing. Was it hard? This is from Jessica Carter. Was it hard to write about pickles from Tripp's point of view after spending so much time in Pickle's head? That's an excellent question, yeah? It is, actually. I, I've never written um, a book series that was from different points of view. They're always from the same point of view with the same like central voice. So yeah, it was hard, especially because Pickle's stuff still felt really important. Like she'd found Connor, but there's all this other stuff she has to do, right? Like she's not just like hanging out in the sun now, like there's an apocalypse. So yeah, it was it was definitely hard to switch gears and, and just focus on um, uh, Trip. I actually, when I first started writing it, Trip was going on his adventure and Pickles went with him. I actually removed Pickles. Like I specifically gave Pickles a reason why she couldn't go on this adventure yeah. so that I could focus <laughs> on Trip. And the kittens, I want to know when the kittens get their own book too. They're all fun. They're little <laughs> the 4077? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The 4077 are pretty awesome. They're going to need their own story. I, I We were talking about this yesterday when we were doing the tech um, run for this, Kev, where you were like, I really want a story with Winter and Wally. And then I was thinking, what if Winter and Wally were like the odd couple, but then the kittens came with them too. And that would just be like a crazy show. That would just be nutty. So be anyway. So cute. Can I can I do some <laughs> illustrations for that one? Because that would yes, be yes, so please. <laughs> uh, question from Anita Yasuda. Did you enjoy reading paranormal and supernatural stories as a child? And if so, what were your favorites? You know, I didn't have enough of them. I would say The Hobbit is as supernatural as I got probably before age 12. Um, and I love The Hobbit. Uh, I love all of those stories. Um, I mean, would you consider uh, Charlotte's Web supernatural? Because it's one of my, I've read it so many times. It's interesting. Uh, it's not paranormal, but it's definitely told from the point of view of the animals, which is kind of the same reflection. Um, I, I will say that I started reading, reading Stephen King far earlier than I probably should have. <laughs> um, so I've read a lot of Stephen King over my years and those were my favorites. So I probably read my first Stephen King when I was 10 or 11, which is probably early. Question from Valerie Sherrard, who also points out you have to ask a question to get in on the draw so that yes, that is true. So her right. question, which enters her into the draw for the original art is how do you see the or what are the age of trip and pickles in comparison to human years? How old do they seem in your head in your imagination? They're supposed to be about 10 or 12 in human years. Uh, pickles starts the book by saying she and Connor were born the same week. So Connor's two, she's two. But in, in human years, like when you do that translation thing, um, they're about 10 or 12 years old. Cool. Uh, Matab asks, now that you know this is a series, how much outlining of plot do you need to do? Do you have each book planned out? Are you a plotter or a pantser? Oh, I believe that I is implying know. by the seat of. <laughs> Your, your pants. I am a pantser. I, I know where we're starting and I know where we're ending. I don't know how we get there. So I'm a pantser uh, for this series. Really the only sort of series that I plot are screenplays, uh, just because I find them very hard. I think I need to, I need to plot out a screenplay, but books, I'm a pantser. I am always fascinated by this. I used to be, and I found I wasn't, I would get too frustrated. I'd, I'd, I'd get lost. Uh, and so I now do way more plotting, like I do the Moleskin notebook plotting thing. So I'm always fascinated, but it is amazing how everybody is different on that one. Uh, do you need to read the first book? This is from Antonia Reed. Do you need to read the first book to understand the second book? Asking for my daughter. Uh, this is a good question. What do you think, Kev? You've read both. I think no, because I think other than, in fact, I what I did was I went back and reread Pickles just because I wanted to sort of reacquaint myself with it. I think they're standalones. I think you both know that the zombie apocalypse 
is the background. There's some, obviously there's some plot points that are in the past in the second book, but I went back and read it and it was not, they're, they're, they're not time happening at the same time, but they have parallel structures that both work. And there's, so I'd say no. Kev says no. There, there's my <laughs> blurb for book seven. Um, can definitely see the Charlotte, oh, this is from Beth Katz Rosenbaum, can definitely see the Charlotte's Web influence. My question is, what is your writing routine? How do you, all caps again, how do you do all you do? Because you have a whole other job, Angela. I do have a couple of other jobs. It's true. Like a lot of people have, you have a couple of other jobs. Like everyone I know has at least two jobs and five books on the go. Um, my writing routine is that I write fiction in the morning and nonfiction in the afternoon. So I literally do journalism after 9 a.m. Uh, and before 9 a.m. I write fiction. Um, and that's, that's how I divide my day. And that's what I do actually, whether I'm like on a weekday, which I know is fictitious now that we're in pandemic, a weekday or a weekend, uh, I divide up my day that way. I try to cut it into those two pieces. Cool. Question from Jennifer Mooksang. Have you had art training? I answered that question because she's crazy. If she had seen these, these are not art training. This is just Angela. Like, honestly, I've seen you guys' art. This is this is Angela art. That's what I'm calling it. It's all right. First of all, it's just I will fun say, and love. Much like I already blurbed your future books. Let me blurb your right. future art. There's no bad mm. art. It's all it's all personal expression. And you, those That's are perfect a, compendiums to your books. It's beautiful art. Don't knock yourself I down. That. I appreciate um, that. Let's see. Uh, wait, you already answered that question in the chat. That's what, what I said. In the chat. You're supposed to be talking to me. <laughs> I'm doing both. <laughs> Fine. All right. So Joe Mahoney asks, if you could change shape into an animal, what kind of animal would you change into and why? Oh, I would like to try a snake. As weird as that sounds, they don't have any arms or legs. I want to see how that works. Like, I, I think about that quite often. Like, how would you even, like, how does it even, I don't understand it snake would be my answer as weird as that is cool what kind of snake do you want to be like a python or do you want to be like a rattlesnake that moves around like that i want to be a sneaky a sneaky snake that nobody's scared of so that i you know i can just like move through life and enjoy myself and nobody's really intimidated by me and i'm just like learning about the world plus they they smell with their tongue there's so much cool stuff about snakes yeah i, I really yeah. would like to learn more about them they get a bad rap. i know thanks they do get a bad rap it's true yeah uh, Rebecca Upjohn wants to know if you sleep. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. And Joe says that was not the answer I expected and says he thinks that you are a Slytherin. Oh, I've tested several times, my friend. I am no Slytherin. Kate Blair asks, have you found your attitude towards your neighborhood raccoon population has changed since you wrote this? Only that I would really like to have one as a pet and everyone in my family says that's not cool. Uh, that was... Okay, that was what I was what popped into my head. Do you ever watch the the British game show Quite Interesting QI? Yes. Okay, so I love it. And they had a thing the other day on, which was about the raccoon problem in Japan, mm -hmm. because they're not native. You know, they're not indigenous to Japan. But they uh, was a book that was super popular about a family that raises a raccoon, sort of like owls in the family. So okay. all people started you know bringing raccoons over realizing you can't really have a raccoon as a pet because they're nasty like i they love them can be. i see them in the backyard all summer long and i don't hate them but yeah they're they're kind of nasty so you can't they're not they're not ready they're not ready yet when the apocalypse comes maybe but they're not ready yet trip 100 percent. i would love to have as a pet for sure yep he's a yeah. negotiator that guy yep yeah. the way he washes his hands <laughs> so cute um it is thank you so much uh thanks to everybody who has a question Chantel's going to come pop back in here and, and start to do some giveaways as well the uh I, I always remember some old cbc training angela was there a question that i didn't ask, didn't that you ask? Would like to answer <laughs> no i think this was wonderful and i i'm really excited about um Bell Hamster and the next book in the series. And I'm really excited that everyone is excited about Trip. It's really wonderful. Writing in pandemic is hard. Launching a book in pandemic is hard. And this has made it so much better. I so appreciate all of you showing up. Kev, thank you so much for making this wonderful. I really appreciate it. I owe you big. 
it's sweet. I, I, the, one of the things I love about both of the books is that they have a huge amount of heart and you can just see kids reading them and going, oh, like it's what, okay, let's put it this way. If I have to read another damn book about a dog, like for, we didn't even yeah. get to the best dog in the universe, which is the Corgi in this book. Cause we don't want to give stuff away. Great dog. But what's interesting to me is like, okay, fine. Another book about dogs. I love the fact that this is a book about raccoons and hamsters, the un, the under dogs. <laughs> you know what? When Pickles was nominated for a sun dog, I thought sun dog. This is so stereotypical. Yes. Sun dogs. Dogs. Gosh, they get all the press. Dogs everywhere. Yeah. No one has a <laughs> pandemic pet raccoon, do they? And if you no. do, we will send you a copy of the book. Absolutely. Um, all right. Uh, that was a blast. Um, all right, Chantel, we're going to call you back. You're going to do some giveaways here. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to Angela and Kevin and a big thank you to all the attendees who joined us today. Before I let you all go, I need to announce the winners of our giveaway. So if I call your name, please send me an email at c.show. Let me write it down in the chat c.cho at cormorantbooks.com um, to claim your prize. And the winners are uh, Matav Narsimhan, Kate, Kate Blair, and also Jessica Carter. Nice. So, wow, well done. Congratulations. The three of you have won Angela's um, original raccoon art. Um, once again, please send me an email and I will make sure that to coordinate everything so that you get those as soon as possible. Uh, so it's time to bring this event to a close. I want to remind everyone that you can request a signed copy of Trip of the Dead from Another Story Bookshop, or you can buy, um, you can buy the book at your local indie bookstore as well. And thank you for coming, everyone. Have a good That's day. A Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thank you.